In February 1983, the residents of an apartment in London were plagued by a foul smell. At first, the property manager thought it was a clogged toilet and arranged for a plumber to fix it. The plumber told the property manager that he had never smelled anything so disgusting in his life. But the smell did not go away in the following days. On Saturday, February 5th, the property manager arranged for the plumber to check again. Around 10 a.m., the plumber came to the side of the apartment. When he lifted the sewer cover, he was shocked. He saw pieces of flesh and bones inside. He quickly called the police. The police analyzed the flesh and bones and concluded that they were human. The police then further investigated the pipes in the apartment and found that the human flesh and bones were flushed down from the top floor tenant. There was only one tenant on the top floor. He was an executive officer at a nearby employment center. His name was Dennis Andrew Nelson. He was 37 years old. To avoid alarming him, the police set up surveillance around the apartment. Detective J and another officer waited at Nilsson's door while others were hiding nearby. At 5.30 p.m., Nilsson returned to his apartment after work. When he came to his door, he saw Jay and his partner. Jay greeted him and said they were there to check the sewer. Nilsson smiled and said, since when do police care about such trivial matters? Then, at Jay's request, Nilsson opened the door. A stench of decay hit them. Jay realized it was the smell of death. The police then subdued Nilsson and began searching his apartment. In the bedroom closet, they found black bags containing dismembered body parts and two skulls. Nilsson was then arrested. Jay interrogated Nilsson and asked him who the two bodies were. Nilsson looked at Jay calmly and said, Officer, you're wrong. It should be 16, right? The police went back to Nilsson's home to search again. This time, they found more horrifying things. Under the tea cabinet in the living room, they found torso bones and skulls. There were also thighs and pelvises under the bathtub. The police pieced together three bodies this time. In addition, based on Nilsson's address, they dug up hundreds of teeth and bones in a garden in Cricklewood. Because the bodies were severely damaged, it was difficult for the police to distinguish how many victims there were. And because forensic technology was limited at that time, the police could only piece together eight bodies in the end. When the police questioned Nilsson again, he joked that if they hadn't caught him, he would have killed 150 people. Dennis Andrew Nilsson was born on November 23, 1945 in Fraserburgh, a fishing town in northeastern Scotland. His mother's family had lived there for generations. Nilsson's father was a Norwegian soldier who stayed in the barracks most of the time. He never had any contact with his father, so their relationship was very weak. He also had a brother and a sister who lived with their grandparents. He was very lonely as a child and had no friends. He also didn't get along well with his mother. Sometimes when his mother came to visit him and hug him, he would refuse to hug her back. But Nelson was very close to his grandfather. They would go for walks by the sea and fish together. But his grandfather often went out to sea to make a living. In 1951, when Nelson was six years old, he came home from school one day and his mother asked him if he missed his grandfather and wanted to see him. Nilsson nodded happily. His mother took him to the bedroom and pointed to a square box and said, Grandpa is in there. Go say goodbye to him. It turned out that his grandfather had died at sea and his body had been brought back for burial. After his grandfather died, his mother told Nilsson that he had gone to a better place. But Nilsson wondered why his grandfather didn't take him along. No one had ever explained to him what death was and he was not prepared for it. His grandfather's sudden death changed his psychology. In 1961, when Nilsson was 15 years old, he joined the Army Catering Corps, where he learned butchery skills. In the Army, Nilsson often listened to the Beatles' music with his colleagues, and he also liked classical music. Nilsson was still very solitary, and he spent most of his time alone. He didn't socialize with others like most people did. One of his comrades said to Nilsson, You're weird. You don't get along with anyone. Actually, he had a secret in his heart. Nilsson realized that he was gay, and he didn't dare to tell his colleagues because they couldn't accept homosexuality. Nilsson tried to divert his attention by developing an interest in photography. He thought that hobbies were more important than love, and they were also a way of expressing his self-worth. Nilsson stayed in the army for 11 years. He ended his military career and moved to London. He settled in Cricklewood Garden in the city center. The people in London were friendly and talkative, and they were more tolerant of homosexuality. There was a gay bar near his home. In the second half of 1972, Nilsson joined the London Metropolitan Police. In 1973, Nilsson completed his police training and officially joined the force. As a junior officer in London, Nilsson worked during the day and frequented gay bars at night. 
He started having relationships with the people there. Eleven months later, at the end of 1973, Nilsson got tired of his police work and chose to resign. He was also very disappointed with his short-term relationships. This went against his original intention of seeking permanent companionship. Nilsson's thinking changed soon after that. He went to the employment center and became a civil servant. But because of his solitary personality, he had difficulty making friends. So after work, Nilsson either went to the bar or went home to drink. He often used alcohol to numb himself. One of Nilsson's few friends said that he liked drinking, but he was not an alcoholic. In 1976, Nilsson met a young man named Gallican, who was unemployed and staying in a hotel. Nilsson found him an apartment and lived with him. It was an old building with old furniture, but there was a French window on the first floor leading to the garden. The two got along well and even raised a dog named Bleep. But as time went by, Nilsson's strong desire for control made Gallican unbearable. Eighteen months later, in 1977, Gallican left Nilsson. His departure deeply hurt Nilsson, and he was surrounded by a strong sense of loneliness. Not long after that, he started inviting more people to his home, but none of them wanted to stay long. Most of them couldn't stand his temper. On New Year's Day in 1979, 33-year-old Nielsen woke up next to a stranger. He could not accept the fact that the man wanted to leave as soon as he woke up, so he decided to keep him. He strangled him with a tie while he was still asleep and put his body in a bucket filled with water. This was Nielsen's first victim and the beginning of his evil deeds. He later said in prison that he started the road to death by having a new roommate who would never leave. Soon after, Nielsen cleaned the body in the bathtub and stored it under the floor of his apartment. He kept it there for eight months. In less than a year, Nielsen killed again. This time, he killed a 23-year-old Canadian student named Kenneth with a pair of headphones. He then took photos of Kenneth's body with a camera and continued to store it under the floor. Nielsen's third victim was a 16-year-old catering apprentice who had been homeless since he came to London. Nielsen lured him home and strangled him. He then cleaned the body and did some unspeakable things to it. In 1980, Nielsen murdered five more young men and put them under the floor. But the floor where he stored the bodies began to smell and attract insects. To avoid suspicion, he decided to build an incinerator in his backyard and burn all the bodies. He also burned car tires that day to mask the smell of burning corpses. After that, Nielsen killed four more boys, three of whom were unidentified. The only victim who could be identified was 23-year-old Malcolm. In June 1981, Nielsen's landlord planned to renovate his apartment, so he gave Nielsen £1,000 to move out. He accepted the money and burned the last few bodies. He then moved to Cranley Gardens, where he was arrested. There, he killed three more men. His last victim was killed in 1983. He washed the body and dismembered it, then flushed some of the parts down the toilet. This clogged the drain and alerted the authorities. Nielsen targeted mostly homeless runaways who frequented bars. He was similar to the American serial killer John Wayne Gacy, who also chose his young victims deliberately because they were unlikely to be reported missing. He lured them to his home with promises of food and alcohol, then strangled them when they fell asleep. Between 1978 and 1983, Nilsson killed at least 16 boys, the youngest being only 14. But the police only found 11 bodies, and only 8 of the victims were formally identified. In November 1983, Nilsson was convicted of 6 counts of murder, and 1 of attempted murder, and sentenced to life imprisonment. In prison, Nilsson was allowed to keep 2 parrots as pets. He died in 2018 from a pulmonary hemorrhage, after serving 34 years.